Pro-Life Talk. Real world answers. This is Life Report. Welcome to Life Report. I am your host, Josh Brom. We have a very, very special guest. We have Abby Johnson from the And Then There Were None Ministry. Abby, thank you so much for coming on with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I think just about everybody has heard your story. But for the, for the few people who are watching or listening who haven't heard your story, could you do like a two-minute, like a brief recap of, of kind of your amazing story? I worked at Planned Parenthood at an abortion clinic for eight years. I was the clinic director there and left in October of 2009 after seeing some things that were a little sketchy um, with budgeting and money and um, those sorts of things. But ultimately, after witnessing a live ultrasound guided abortion procedure where I watched a 13 week old child um, struggle and fight for his life during the abortion procedure, um, ultimately lose that battle. And I knew that at that time I, I had to leave. I had to get out. I knew I'd been lying to women. I knew I had been lied to. And so I left and joined the pro-life movement and didn't think I would be doing anything like this, but um, I'm just honored to be you know, working alongside all the amazing people that fight for life and started this abortion clinic worker ministry strictly because there was a need, because I was getting emails and phone calls from uh, people that were inside the industry that wanted to leave that wanted out and they needed help and they didn't know where to go. So um, we founded the ministry in June of 2012 and we've had 101 workers come to us, um, come through our ministry. That is awesome. Uh, Okay, I think one of the best things you could do is help pro-life people to understand better where a, a, a clinic worker, you know, who's at Planned Parenthood or another abortion clinic is coming from. I think there are a lot of misconceptions Um, uh, about people that are in that situation, and you were. So can you help pro-life people to understand the things that you think maybe they don't understand super well about the clinic workers and where they're coming from? So I think clinic workers have been a marginalized group of people in the pro-life movement for the past 40 years. Um, You know, I think pro-life people need for, for a long time, they've needed someone to blame. So they blame the people that work in the clinics because they're an easy scapegoat. They're an easy target. Um, you know, they're the ones doing it. They're the ones holding the instruments. They're the ones counseling these women. And so um, that just makes them an easy target. But, you know, in reality, you know, these people that work in the clinics, both men and women, they are there because they believe they're doing the right thing um, because they they're not anti-baby that's one thing i I see pro-lifers do and say that's just absolutely ridiculous people that are pro-choice don't hate babies um these workers don't hate babies they just believe in you know a woman being able to have a child when she wants to have a child and uh and they they they're not bad people they're just misguided by sin like all of us are whenever we sin and uh, they're really no different than than you and me uh they're moms they're dads they're you know daughters they have families their husbands and wives and a lot of people that work in the industry are are working there because it's a good paying job with really good benefits and you know when you have a family to think about um that that really is your number one priority and so you know they get paid well in the abortion industry and if they can just somehow justify what they're doing if they can justify their work um then it makes it a lot easier to go to work every day and that's essentially what they're doing and that's essentially what we do every day whenever we sin absolutely that's exactly what i was about to say is that justification thing sounds pretty familiar to me um, yeah. Are you differentiating at all be, uh, between how you talk about um, clinic workers who are not um, actually performing the abortions and the abortionists, or are you kind of putting them all together in the, in the same group? No, I mean, I, I put them all together. I think, you know, pro-lifers, um, they need to hate the abortionists. I mean, they just, they need to kind of fuel that anger that they feel um, for the abortion industry. And so they target the abortion doctor. Um, 
you know, but we have seen amazing conversions come out of abortion clinics, um, you know, via abortion clinic doctors. And, you know, I, I think for us to say as pro-lifers, you know, well, and, and this is something that pro-lifers do that really, really gets my nerves too, is that they talk about how abortionists are bottom of the barrel doctors. How yeah, I've they're heard just, that. I've heard the, people say that you know, kind of like losery doctors that couldn't make it through college, that couldn't make it through med school. And I just think, like, how damaging is that? Because we want these doctors to convert. We want them to become pro-life physicians. We want them to fight for life. And so I look at doctors like John Bertalski. I look at um, Dr. Anthony Leventino. I look at Dr. Bernard Nathanson. So many doctors that have had conversions on the issue of abortion that once performed abortions in a practice. And I think, really are we saying that these doctors who now work every day to preserve life are the ones that are at the bottom of the barrel they're not they're you know the these men are amazing doctors and they you know now they work to protect the unborn and to protect their moms and so we have to be really careful with our words and we have to think about the long-term implications of what we're saying and what we're saying about these people that work in the industry, including the physicians. Before we talk about how pro-life people should talk um, with and about ex-clinic workers or post-abortive women, from your perspective, how do pro-life people often communicate with or about ex-clinic workers um, and post-abortive women and even pro-choice people in your experience? So I think there's a lot of just anger, um, a lot of misunderstanding, um, a lot of dehumanization of people that not only have worked in the industry, but women that have had abortions. You know, I'm a person that has worked in the industry and has had two abortions. So I'm like a double whammy. It's hard for people to look at their own life and go, hmm, I'm really not better than those people that are working in the abortion industry. You know, like, my sin hurts the heart of God, just like every other sin does. And so, you know, my sin separates me from God. And I'm not saying all sin is equal. I'm not even getting into that theological debate. Right. I'm just saying every sin that we commit separates us from God. Every sin hurts the heart of God. And so all the time, I, you know, <laughs> your pro-lifers will go, oh, you know, how do these workers look in the mirror every day? And, you know, how, how can they do that? Well, how do you look in the mirror every day? You know, when you sin, um, you know, it's pretty easy when you're justifying your life of sin. It's, it's not hard at all. Um, so I, you know, I think probably the most interesting thing for me and, and really, I mean, honestly, the most disheartening thing for me, um, since becoming pro-life is just the amount of people who, and I mean, I think we would like to really believe in our hearts that it is this tiny, minuscule group of people in the pro-life movement, but it's it's not. It's much bigger than what we actually want to admit. Um, but this, you know, these groups of people who don't believe in forgiveness, they don't believe in redemption, they don't believe that conversion is real for people, um, they, you know, they want to carry that anger in their heart against these workers and against these women, um, instead of applauding them and going, wow, you know, you saw the error of your ways and now you're doing everything you can to speak out and protect other people from making that decision. Wow. You know, what a courageous choice. What, what an amazing heart you have, you know, <laughs> whatever, you know, how brave you are for being so vulnerable and sharing about this very personal experience that you went through in your life. We're just so quick to, you know, slam down the hammer and be judge and jury. And that's something that we we do need to be really careful of, particularly for women that have had abortions, because, look, nobody wants to have an abortion. Nobody has an abortion going in there, you know, thinking, well, today's such a good day. I'm going to have an abortion. I mean, they're going in there because they feel like they have no other choice. And to me, that's partially a failure on the pro-life movement. 
because they don't know about the resources that are out there. They don't know about pregnancy centers. We're not doing a good enough job to reach out to them, you know, before they even have that moment of crisis. And so, you know, I don't see it just as a, as a failure on these women that are going into the clinics. I see it as a failure on our movement and, you know, what we've been doing to reach out to them before the crisis even happens. Compare and contrast the way a lot of pro-life people, especially the, the crazy people that end up on your Facebook page. I don't know why you attract all the crazies, but there's a lot of them on your page. Um, compare and contrast that with what Sean Carney and his team did when you were working at Planned Parenthood and the difference be between you know what, what, what made an impact on you. I, I think of the crying nun in your book. When I went to Sean and the Coalition for Life, you know, I... I didn't know how they were going to react. I mean, they had every right to look at me and go, you know what? You owe us a big old apology because you have been rude to us for the past eight years and you've turned the sprinklers on us and, you know, you've cussed us out um, when we're standing out there praying. You know, they had every, I mean, I was not a nice clinic worker. So, um, you know, I was not charitable. So, you know, they had every reason to be like, we need a little bit of groveling from you, you know, but they didn't. They were just, they had no reason to trust me. They had no reason to believe that I was being sincere, you know, except that I was a, a flipping mess, you know, when I walked into their door and, you know, they knew me well enough to know that I'm, I, you know, I have a pretty strong personality. So, you know, me weeping on their couch was probably out of character. Um, but they had no reason to to believe me, believe anything I was saying. I mean, nothing. But they did. They were willing to take a chance on an abortion clinic director, you know. And um, I remember uh, after the media, you know, became really interested in the story and everything. And there was this reporter that called one of the gals from the coalition, um, named Karen. And uh, she had been there the day that I came over to their building and, you know, all of this. And the reporter was trying to get the goods on Abby Johnson. You know, they, the reporter was like, we want to know, you know, what was she like? How terrible was she? You know, tell us really what Abby Johnson's like, you know. And it was great because she just she just looked at him and she said, you know what, I can't really talk about that person anymore because she's a new creation in Christ and that she's not that person, you know? And, um, and I just thought that's the closest I think that I'll ever get to God's forgiveness in human form. You know, just that it was, the slate was just wiped clean. There was nothing else to talk about from the past. There was, you know, the old Abby that was mean and, and rude and hateful, like that person was gone in their eyes. And that, was just such a blessing to me and, and something that people can really look to as an example of how we should treat these workers. And, and yeah, you are taking a chance on them. You better believe it. Um, but gosh, if, if they're sincere and if they're being honest, which everybody that we've reached that that's reached out to us has been sincere and honest about their conversion, then, you know, what an amazing testament to the power of the pro-life movement, the power of prayer, and we should be willing to take those types of risks. What effect would it have had on you if you were still working at Planned Parenthood and saw the way that some pro-life people talk about people who work in abortion clinics? Uh, I would still be there. Uh, I mean, I'll just give you an example. In 2007, so two years before I resigned, um, I had developed a really great relationship with one of the sidewalk counselors um, that was out there. And she, I didn't know it at the time, but she was like targeting me, you know, she's out there every day when I showed up for work and everything. And um, I just really liked her. You know, I was like Facebook stalking her and, you know, I just really was kind of drawn to her and just, I don't know, really felt comfortable with her and felt like she was being really genuine and sincere. And she had asked me, you know, hey, I would really like to take you to you know, to lunch or get coffee or, you know, let's just talk and whatever. And I was like, yeah, you know, okay. And so I was really thinking about it. I remember sitting at my desk one day thinking, you know, I'm, I'm going to call her, like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to, and she was really wearing on my heart, you know, and, and really softening my heart. And then that same day that I was going to call her, this guy who, um, was a, a real hindrance to what they were trying to do in Brian College Station. He showed up 
And he started writing down everybody's license plate numbers that, you know, all the clients that were there. And he was taking pictures of all the women that were walking in and out. And it wasn't a day that we were doing abortions. It was just a family planning day. And that day when I got home in the mail, he had sent a postcard out to me and everyone in my neighborhood and my parents and everybody in my parents' neighborhood um, calling me a child molester, telling people that I that they should not allow their children to be close to me because I kill children and I violate children. Um, and that day I was like, I can never talk to any of them again. That was it. Like that, that was it. And, and I think back like to that time and I think, man, what if he hadn't have done that? Like I could have been out in 2007. Like that could have been two years of my life that I wasn't responsible for killing unborn children. But because of those types of like dirty antics by somebody who publicly professes that he's a pro-life person, um, I was there for another two years. And it just caused me to really dig my heels in even further and to say, I am doing the right thing. And if these people are pro-life and they're Christians and I don't want to be any part, I don't want to be a part of any of that. Um, and so I think, I think we do have to be careful and, you know, all I can say is, and I said this in my book, I'm glad that God doesn't allow us to see the future. Um, because if I would have seen, you know, what I saw, what I have seen, if I would have seen them, what I have seen over the past four and a half years, um, I don't know that I would have left, you know, I was very comfortable with what I was doing. I was very comfortable in my job and, um, Gosh, having I never had to defend myself to my own supporters. Um, but, you know, that's just that's one way that God protects us is, you know, by not allowing us to see ahead and just giving us grace, you know, every day for that moment. OK, so I think the message that you're saying is that what people do really has an impact on people who work in clinics. And, and it doesn't have to be as obviously wrong as taking down license plates, taking down pictures, or wearing mm -hmm. a Grim Reaper costume. It can be things that are more subtle. So let me ask you about the other, I, I know that there's like pro-life people in my head right now, they're listening right now. And they're saying, you're, you're being too nice. How can I, you know, uh, properly extend, uh, extend kind of the, the appropriate amount of mercy without justifying the act of abortion, without lessening kind of the appropriate amount of guilt? How do you find that balance? I get that all the time. Like, you're, you're too nice to people that work in clinics. You're too nice to the pro-choicers. Well, I mean, I don't know, maybe I am, but that niceness has, has, has helped to convert over a hundred workers right. now. So, you know, if that's what nice niceties get you, then I'm for that, you know? Um, I don't believe in vilifying the other side that doesn't get us anywhere. Um, it only makes us enemies. And uh, I'm not I'm not interested in making enemies with people. Um, so, I, you know, I think though that you can be honest. I mean, I, I you know, I never, I never looked at the people that were, uh, you know, on the other side of my fence when I worked at the clinic and went, I think they really are. I think I think we really are both pro-choice. I mean, I knew where they stood. I knew they were against abortion. I knew they did not believe in what I was doing. Um, but yet they were still showing me dignity. And I think that's really important. You don't have to agree with somebody. It was the same with my parents. You know, I mean, my parents, both pro-life, everybody in my family, pro-life. I mean, I was the only weirdo, you know, that was pro-choice. And they never nagged me about it, but I knew where they stood and they were very firm. If it ever came up, you know, they, my, my mom would be quick to say, well, Abby, you know that we disagree on this. I mean, you know, it's, it's an unborn child. And even when I was pregnant with my daughter, who's seven now, I was working at the clinic when I was pregnant with her. And, you know, there were a couple of instances where, you know, my mom was like, it's weird how, you know, you're pregnant with Grace and she is a baby. You know, but the other the other women that come into your clinic, like you abort those babies and you don't say it's a baby, you know, so like what's the you know, what where's the inconsistency there? And um, so, I mean, you can certainly talk to people, reach out to people and love, but also be very firm about where you stand and and not compromise on your beliefs. I've never compromised. I mean, whenever I talk to people, when I go out to the clinics and talk to abortion clinic workers, they know where I stand, um, but I can still respect 
the dignity of their person. I can still um, show them kindness and show them love and show them mercy and show them that if they ever want to leave, we will be there to help them. Explain a little bit about And Then There Were None um, and just how that works, because I've got a follow-up question for you uh, uh, about it. But first, kind of explain the, the ministry. Yeah, so um, we basically, you know, we don't, um, you know, we don't have an advertising budget. I mean, it's like, you know, an organization with no money. Um, and uh, we don't have paid staff. And we certainly don't have a, an advertising budget. But um yeah, so we, you know, we, they come to us and uh, they are people that are, they're in crisis too, just like we help, you know, moms that are in crisis, these pregnant women, um, these workers are in crisis. And so we um, are able to provide several streams of support for them. We help um, with any sort of legal situation that they might have been involved in that maybe was illegal or that they they knew that the doctor, you know, like let's say he wasn't reporting minor abortions or he was covering up minor abortions or Medicaid fraud or something like that. Um, we have more than 3,000 attorneys that have stepped forward and have said, you know, we are willing to help these these workers pro bono, um, you know, we will help them navigate through the legal process. So we want to make sure that their interests are protected. Um, so we do that. That's one of the first things that we do. We can help them with um, employment, just, you know, helping to get personal references from, you know, people that own businesses in the area. Um, that's really the best because when you have, when you have an abortion clinic on your resume, that doesn't really look great to employers. So, um, you know, surprise people think, oh, well, it's, you know, it shouldn't matter because everybody's so pro-choice. But you know what? When push comes to shove, like these employers know what goes on inside of an abortion clinic and they don't want those types of employees in their businesses. So um, so if we can get like a personal, you know, reference might manages or owns a business, that's really the best. Um, we help them with um, emotional support. We have a, a network you know, full of, you know, dozens and dozens of workers who um, have left. And that's really, I think, the best part of our ministry is being able to connect these workers with other people who have been in the exact same spot that they are, who know about the struggles, who know about the emotional turmoil, that they can share that freely and, in, in, you know, in a safe environment. Um so we have that for them. We also provide healing retreats for them, um, similar to, you know, like a post-abortive type of healing ministry, but specific for the abortion clinic workers' needs. Um, we also will help with financial support. So we'll help them transition out of the industry and into another job um, outside of the industry. You know, we don't ever want money to be a reason that someone stays in the abortion clinic. And, you know, I mean, some people don't get that, but as somebody who worked in the clinic, saw the evil, and then wanted to get out, you you just can't flee from that quick enough. And it's a miserable feeling to walk into work knowing I'm participating in something that is evil, and I'm only here because I don't have another paycheck coming. Um, and so we want to help alleviate that kind of stress. Um, and then we also provide spiritual support. We get them in contact if, you know, if they want to get in contact with clergy or, you know, church in their area. Um, we we kind of partner them up with somebody that can help them do that locally. Okay, so here's my follow-up. I know that there are some pro-life people, and we're not going to name anybody, but there are some pro-life people who have said that, or at least have gotten the impression that you don't even care about saving babies from abortion. You only care about clinic workers. What would you say to them? For me, it's it's not mutually exclusive. Um, you know, I believe that they go hand in hand. So, you know, the reason that I have this ministry is yes, to help abortion clinic workers, you know, yes, connect them back to Christ. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, that's why we do it. But um, the under, I mean, the underlying goal of our ministry, and it's right there in our vision statement, is that we will end abortion through doing this, that we will close down these clinics and that babies will not be legally killed by abortion because these workers are coming out, telling what they know. You know, I mean, just right now, we've got 
um, a clinic up in the Northeast where they've had five workers come to us this past week. They virtually have nobody left in their clinic um, working at their clinic. And, you know, so, and they're having a really hard time from what we understand. They were having a hard time keeping employees and finding employees anyway. So if we can shut down clinics that way, then it saves babies. So it's all, it's all very interconnected. So to say I only care about one or only, you know, I think that's just, I mean, it's a completely false statement. And, um, and, you know, I would say, you know, to people that have said that, I'm kind of like, you know, a lot of people that have said that are, are more pro baby. So they're not, um, they're not really focused on the woman in crisis. They're not focused on the clinic workers. And I, I think that's, the wrong way to go about fighting this, this war. I mean, I think we have to care about everybody involved in abortion. If we want to end abortion in this country, I mean, we have to go about providing a culture change and we can't do that by just going out there and saving babies. We have to save everybody that's involved in the abortion process. How can people find, uh, 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 learn more about the, and then the Renan ministry? The website is abortionworker.com. We have a link, a resources link up at the top where people who, you know, if you're a sidewalk counselor, if you have, uh, you know, conversations with abortion clinic workers, if you have that opportunity, um, you can print out our flyers. We have a printable version there. You can print them out. You can give them to workers. You can mail them into the clinics. Um, we do that all the time. You know, I pick up the phone and call an abortion clinic at least once a day and just say, Hey, you know, just in case you ever want to leave, we have this ministry that can help you. You know, I had a girl one time, I said, uh, you know, I said, hi, this is Abby Johnson. I work in the pro-life movement. She goes, oh my gosh, you're like famous. Awesome. <laughs> like, well, not really, but <laughs> but you probably hear about me a lot. So just abortionworker.com. We have stories from workers that have left, that have come through our ministry. And um, we have some letters and things that you can print out and send it, send in to uh, the clinics and, and, uh, yeah, so we're here to help. We have a contact link. So if you have questions, it's scary for people sometimes I think to reach out to abortion clinic workers cause they don't know, like they're very, uh, temperamental and they're kind of, you know, you just never know what you're going to get when you talk to an abortion clinic worker. And so, um, you know, we're here to help with that, with those, any kind of questions you have or anything like that. Okay, you can find links to all of those things if you go to prolifepodcast.net. Abby, thank you so much for coming on with us. You're one of my favorite guests thank we've you. ever had. Thank you. And remember, if you want to have a great impact in any conversation, you've got to remember to ask good questions, listen to understand, and find genuine common ground when possible. That's our show. Have a great week, and now go talk to someone. You've been watching Life Report, Pro-Life Talk, Real World Answers. Life Report is produced by Right to Life of Central California. Visit their website at fresnoprolife.org.